Hello and welcome back to The Crime Reel. I have an amazing story for you today, of which there is a fairly big chance that you haven't heard this one before. Today we shall be looking at the life of one of America's most prolific yet enigmatic confidence men, Dr. Robert Vernon Spears. He is the figure at the centre of one of the greatest whodunits of airline history, as described by the Time magazine in 1960. Our narration today has been written by the author Alan C. Logan, based on the research which he completed for his book, Self-Styled, Chasing Dr. Robert Vernon Spears. In this book, he pieces together the dramatic true story after collecting thousands of documents and newspaper articles across the decades of the con man's life. Alan has done extensive research on con men and is also the author of The Greatest Hoax on Earth, which provided new revelations about a better known con man, Frank, catch me if you can, Abagnale, which I also recently covered on the crime reel. In fact, Alan told me that when he started sharing the story of Dr. Robert Spears, many people would draw comparisons with Frank Abagnale. But while Logan's deep investigation proved that Frank Abagnale's claims in Catch Me If You Can were almost entirely false, the story of Robert Vernon Spears proved to be true and arguably more fascinating. Indeed, when Robert reached the height of his notoriety in 1960, Life magazine described it as a case so bizarre that even the most imaginative mystery writer would hesitate to use the plot. Those disappointed to learn Catch Me If You Can is largely untrue might be interested to discover this true story of this more mysterious con man. So here is Alan's account of the life of Dr. Robert Vernon Spears. The mystery of Robert's identity actually begins with his birth on June the 26th, 1894 in Cassville, Missouri. His mother, Matilda, used various identities herself and listed her child in official documents under several different names, including Clyde Stringer and Clyde Porter. She told Robert, or Clyde as he was then known, that his father had died, although this was not true. Virtually penniless, Matilda and her two children moved between the small towns of rural Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri and Arkansas. When Clyde was nine years old, Matilda married a stonemason, William Gallion of Pryor, Oklahoma. Life with his stepfather was turbulent and Clyde found salvation in the railways, stowing away to new places and practicing new identities. By the time Clyde was 16 years old, there were numerous reports of a dashing young man answering his description, passing bad checks in neighboring towns. He was buying fancy clothes and overpaying for his accommodations so that he would be reimbursed in cash. His first known serious charge was in 1913 when he was 18 years old. He was charged with cashing a forged check at an MKT railroad office in Oklahoma. It was for only $9, which is around $233 today. But the popular larrikin embarrassed both the railroad and his pursuers and paid a heavy price. The headlines virtually cheered for the smooth young lad who got one over on the railway. They deployed a special agent and Clyde was finally apprehended in Kansas after a cat and mouse chase. He spent both his 19th and 20th birthdays in the Oklahoma State Reformatory. On his release in August 1914, he started using new aliases and was reportedly a favourite with women. By 1917, the affable, well-dressed young man was wanted for passing bad checks all across Oklahoma. Businesses began displaying his check artistry in their shop windows as a warning to other unsuspecting retailers. On the run after buying diamonds with forged checks, he borrowed an automobile to make his getaway. The authorities found the vehicle with a polite note with instructions to return the car to its rightful owner, all adding to his reputation as a gentleman thief. When he was eventually apprehended, the nice young man convinced all of those he had defrauded to withdraw the charges so he could join the army, which they all happily agreed to. In December 1917, Clyde signed up to the military under the name of Robert Vernon Spears. He even stole from a young man called Gilbert, who he befriended at the recruitment office. 
Seemingly still under the spell of Robert's charm, Gilbert refused to press charges and pleaded with the police to let his friend go. Spears is not a bad fellow, even if he did take my money, he insisted to the frustrated chief of police. And besides, I like him and would like to serve in the trenches with him, said Gilbert. After basic training, Robert was deployed to England with the 314th Aero Squadron in World War I. He ingratiated himself with commanding officers and was promoted to sergeant within days of arrival. Based in Stonehenge, there is no record that he saw combat, but he was flown in a two-seater biplane to hospital in Oxford for a chest infection. For the remainder of the war, he was transferred between the lounge sections of various hospitals and was a favourite with the nurses. Eventually, he returned to New York for an honourable discharge in February 1919. Robert, then 24 years old, immediately went on a performing tour as a vaudeville actor, returned war hero and escape artist, billing himself as Lieutenant Zaro, the handcuff king escapist. He also lectured on fabricated exploits in France. By March 1919, he had convinced 40-year-old Aura Clayton to sell her business and accompany him as his wife. They married within a week, but two days later, Aura Spears awoke to find him gone. So was her valuable watch and a small sum of money. When he was caught a month later, headlines announced, two-day hubby arrested for deserting wife. It seemed that the authorities weren't quite sure what to do with the likeable scoundrel. After a minimal penalty of only a couple of months in the local jail, Robert was on his way again. By January 1920, he had settled in Oakland, California, and soon befriended his Swedish landlord's daughters, who provided the perfect entry for Robert into high society. He seemed the perfect match for 23-year-old beauty Dorothy Eastwood Hayes, who believed he was the son of respected Dr. and Mrs. George Spears of Toledo, Ohio. Robert told Dorothy he was a university-educated electrical engineer and investor in Oklahoman oil futures, a man with clear prospects. In no time, Robert found himself in the San Francisco Society pages, announcing his engagement supper dance at the grand home of Dorothy's parents, and also their anticipated spring wedding. A natural salesman, Robert easily gained legitimate employment at the Marchant Calculating Machine Company, and he soon became one of the top salesmen in the Pacific Northwest. No one questioned Robert's careful excuses why his family could not attend their wedding in June 1921. Dorothy's parents bought Robert a prized Mercedes automobile, and the couple moved to Seattle, where Robert had been tasked with expanding Marchant's sales operations. But within weeks, Robert explained his oil investments had failed and he was penniless. Dorothy's parents sent money, but Robert soon discovered the family was not as wealthy as he had assumed. In April 1922, almost a year after their nuptials, Dorothy was shocked by a call from jail asking her to wire $750. That's the equivalent of over $11,000 today. The money was needed to bail Robert out. Assuming it was a misunderstanding, the family borrowed money for his release. The charges were dropped, and with finances exhausted, Dorothy and Robert moved back to live with her parents. Family relations became increasingly strained when it was discovered that Robert had taken the bail money and squandered it. But it was another year before Dorothy's parents asked Robert to leave and Dorothy filed for divorce in July 1923. The indulgent playground of the Roaring Twenties offered many opportunities for a con man. To begin with, Robert ran mainly short schemes and cons and successfully evaded the law. By 1926, he had assumed his boldest identity yet, Oscar L.A. Delano. This great Gatsby-like character was based on a well-known real New York millionaire at the time. It was the heyday of celebrity gangster culture glamorised by Hollywood, but the suave and sophisticated con men prided themselves on never using force to remove money from their mark, taking money from the fat cats who could afford it, or big businesses that would barely notice. 
Robert recruited a team, including edgy women, to lure wealthy marks in various schemes. As Playboy Delano, Robert even set up rooms at the exclusive Coronado Hotel in St. Louis and had so many women in and out of his hotel rooms, it attracted the suspicions of the local police. When they raided his room, Robert was dressed in silk pyjamas, entertaining two women in a single bed. Not realising his real identity, the police released Robert before his real crimes were discovered. When a multitude of schemes were uncovered, police returned to the hotel to find that L.A. Delano had fled, leaving his unpaid bill. It was some weeks before the police learned his real identity, as they put out an alert for the tall, fair, well-dressed man driving an expensive car who was, in their words, a favourite with the opposite sex. The chase continued before Robert was eventually captured in Kansas, where he made the error of impersonating a bald man. The front page headlines chuckled that Spears was foiled by having too much hair. He pleaded guilty to all charges and was sent to Leavenworth Prison in March 1927. While there, the popular prisoner received mail from multiple women from all over the United States. With good behaviour, Robert was released within months and back to his usual tricks. Everything changed in 1928 when he was caught for check fraud and sentenced to two years in Missouri State Penitentiary. Not because he decided to go straight, but because that is where he met William Allen Taylor, also known as Al. Al was a first time white collar offender, a clerk with a good eye for numbers and a nose for opportunity. Disenchanted with life, Al had embezzled a fortune from his employers in Memphis and deserted his wife and five-year-old son. Coincidentally, he was also living large at the Coronado Hotel in St. Louis when he was caught, his flashy clothes and fancy car drawing the attention of the local police. Al and Robert developed a strong bond and what would become as a close, lifelong friendship. Robert was released a few months before Al and was waiting when his friend walked out the gates in 1930. For the next 10 years they had the time of their lives and were virtually inseparable. They worked confidence schemes up and down the eastern half of the United States. Al's business knowledge brought an added level of sophistication to their confidence schemes as they started targeting large corporations and recruiting other con artists for much longer cons. Witnesses described Al as becoming the brains behind the operation. Their scams were not always successful and they served time together in Ohio, Florida, Washington, DC and Maryland. With the exception of the several stints when Robert claiming to be a Canadian and deliberately had himself deported to Canada to avoid jail time, the two were mostly joined at the hip both inside jail and out. Their final prison term together was in Maryland State Penitentiary, both men then in their forties. After almost 12 years together, Al made the hard decision of going straight. When released in 1940, Al moved to Tampa, Florida for a new life as a quiet, unassuming tire salesman. Robert made a fresh start in Minneapolis, Minnesota. With a typewriter and doctored resume, he got work as a writer for a religious newspaper, The Wesley News. A year later, when Al was engaged to marry divorcee Alice Steele, Robert also appeared to be settling down. He took out a marriage license with 32-year-old Benita Foster in November 1941, but Robert got cold feet and left town a week before his wedding. He was bound for California and paid $15 for a cross-country rideshare with three strangers. Robert's plans were derailed when the bag with his earnings disappeared and he suspected one of his fellow passengers. The normally cool and controlled Robert became uncharacteristically enraged and pulled out a revolver in the first and only menacing act of his career. He marched the suspects into a cornfield, tied them up and searched them. Unable to find his money, he forced them into the back seat to drive them to a local police station and report the theft. Bizarrely, he placed a chloroform-soaked blanket all over his passengers. As they entered the small town of Weatherford, Oklahoma, 
The passengers regained consciousness and threw the chloroformed blanket over Spears. There was a struggle to control the gun as Robert lost control of the vehicle and hit a row of parked cars. Three rounds went off, grazing the head of one passenger and passing through the chest of another. Miraculously, neither wound was fatal. Robert was shot in the hand during the Hollywood-style tussle for the gun, with Weatherford townsfolk in pursuit. Robert incredibly took a tear gas gun from his pocket. He let a round off, tear gassing the pursuers, including the mayor of Weatherford. Robert was back in the headlines again after the weird gunfight tale. The headline read, two men shot, three anaesthetized in wild 1,000 mile car ride. As soon as his identity and criminal history became known, Robert was the only one charged. He faced his first serious offense, first degree robbery, which in Oklahoma could meet with the death penalty. The notoriety of the case attracted a prominent defense attorney who negotiated a generous plea deal. Four years for second degree robbery if Robert pleaded guilty to stealing the car at gunpoint. Having armed robbery on his resume was infuriating for the gentleman conman who maintained that he was set up. Robert had a strangely respectful relationship with the law. When caught, he would normally admit what he had done fair and square as long as it was true. Robert spent just two years in Oklahoma State Penitentiary at McAllister, missing his friend Al Taylor's wedding. Robert was determined to stay out of prison when released in May 1944. He began planning for a new career as a respectable doctor in Dallas. He started making influential contacts and learning the ropes by attending medical conferences. He obtained a legitimate Texas license albeit based on a forged degree and largely focused on lifestyle and psychological medicine. By 1950, he had a thriving practice, mainly using non-invasive, low-risk, naturopathic remedies. He married 25-year-old Frances Massey in 1950 and settled into respectable social circles in the Dallas suburbs. Although he listed himself as an MD, he mainly moved in naturopathic circles, which had gained popularity as a backlash to the harsh drugs and surgeries of the 19th century. Throughout this period, Robert and Al were in regular correspondence, and Al would frequently come to stay with Robert and Francis on his holidays, but he would always come alone. Alice openly disliked Robert and could not understand the friendship between the men. She was unaware of their criminal past and blamed Robert for the eventual breakdown of her marriage and divorce from Al in 1955. Alice and Al remained amicable for the sake of their son, Junior. Robert was active and enormously popular in his new profession. Remarkably, he was elected president of the Texas Association of Naturopathic Physicians and secretary of the National Association of Naturopathic Physicians by 1956, he hosted the International Conference for Naturopathic Physicians. In 1957, amid a government inquiry into political corruption in the Texas legislature, his criminal past was almost exposed. Robert was called to testify to allegations that Representative James Cox had been bribing the naturopathic physicians, threatening to outlaw the practice unless they paid large sums annually. Dr. Robert's rival, Dr. Howard Harmon, had hired a private investigator because of his suspicions that association funds had gone missing under Robert's presidency. Howard Harmon also mounted a coup and ousted Robert from the presidency. Rather than challenge this, Robert and his many followers established a new rival association. Just as Howard was about to expose Robert, the Texas legislature retaliated against allegations of corruption by banning all naturopathic medicine. Clinical practice became illegal and the police raided the offices of naturopathic doctors throughout the state. Somehow, with the political chaos and general disarray of his profession, the details of Robert's criminal past did not become public. When 63-year-old Robert then discovered his wife Frances was pregnant, there was added pressure to find a new career. He had already befriended Hollywood legend Dr. Donald Loomis, fitness guru to the A-list movie stars. 
After leaving MGM Studios, Donald Loomis had set up a chiropractic practice to disguise his far more lucrative activities as an abortionist. In the days before oral contraception, the underworld of illegal abortion was at perilous heights. With millions of women seeking abortions, it was safer for the police to tolerate competent practitioners like Donald Loomis rather than drive desperate women further underground to untrained butchers. By 1958, Robert had set up his own lucrative home visiting service in Dallas. He had obtained a formula for a non-surgical, non-invasive abortion paste and offered to supply Donald Loomis and go into business with the chiropractor in Los Angeles. Robert bought a house not far from Donald's Palos Verde Estates mansion. In March 1958, following a complaint from a Dallas motel, the police raided the room of a couple who had just employed Robert's services. The case was resolved with a misdemeanor plea and a $1,000 fine. With the Spears' second child on the way, they put their Dallas home on the market and made the move to Los Angeles, where Donald operated without interference from the police. Robert thrived in Los Angeles, generating $2,000 a week working with Donald. That money is around $17,000 today. Things went well until a complaint in July 1959 that forced the hand of the LAPD. Robert was arrested and cooperated fully with the police. By naming Donald as his partner, Robert was hoping for leniency. This backfired and Donald was also arrested. A decade of insulation from law enforcement evaporated and so did Donald's friendship with Robert. The trial was set for December 3rd, 1959. Robert hoped the charges could be resolved as easily as they had in Dallas. Robert gave up abortions and instead he travelled extensively selling his formula through his extensive networks. As a frequent traveller, Robert purchased several travel insurance policies that would pay $122,000 on his death. This is about $1 million today. Robert and his old friend Al exchanged numerous letters in this period. They appeared to be planning to go into business together again, and in one letter, Robert mysteriously urged Al not to use his real name in future communications, but to refer to him as F for Foxtrot, Massey. In September of 1959, Al drove to New York with his stepson, and is believed to have met Robert there, along with unknown others. Two months later, Robert and Al spent the weekend of November the 14th together in Tampa, Florida. Al's son, Junior, who was 17 at the time, saw the men drinking and laughing in Robert's hotel room in a celebratory mood. According to Junior, Al was carrying over $600 in cash, which was unusual, and Robert and Al were planning to meet an unknown man they referred to as The Fellow. Alice also had multiple visits from Al that weekend. He seemed stressed and agitated, looking for Junior. He said that he was about to fly to Atlanta to look for a new job. Around the same time, in the early hours of November the 16th, 1959, Robert was scheduled to fly back to Dallas. These events all took on a new significance when flight 967 to Dallas disappeared from radar at 1.55 a.m. and crashed into the Gulf of Mexico. 42 people were on the passenger manifest, including Dr. Robert Spears of Dallas. There were no survivors and flight debris suggested foul play. This evidence and more is discussed in detail in the book Self Styled. A number of early theories emerged as the families of the passengers were notified, including Francis Spears, widowed at the age of 35 with two small children. Several witnesses recalled seeing a man in a brown suit carrying a newspaper but no luggage hurrying toward the flight 967 gate right at closing time, but it is not clear if this man ever boarded the flight. Within days it became clear that Al Taylor had also disappeared. There was no evidence that he had gone to Atlanta as planned and his car was also missing. It was a distinctive salmon pink 1957 Plymouth. Alice, who openly loathed Robert, was suspicious there was a connection between Robert and her missing ex-husband, but the authorities would not take her seriously. 
Eventually, Alice got a court order to open Al's mailbox and discovered an airline insurance policy. It revealed that Al had bought a $37,500 life insurance policy at a vending machine in Tampa Airport at 12.16am, just 9 minutes before flight 967 departed. But more significantly, he has listed his destination as Dallas, where flight 967 was headed, not Atlanta. Alice Taylor, whose bridge parties were the talk of Tampa society pages, soon became the centre of national headlines, speculating that her ex-husband Al was on flight 967. This raised the question that Al may have been the man in a brown suit. It then emerged that Al was in significant debt and his expensive car was about to be repossessed. All good reasons to disappear. Authorities admitted that would have been their conclusion had it not been for the insurance policy. They issued a national alert for Owl's Pink Plymouth. There was speculation that the nine minute window was too tight for Owl to make the flight and that the policy was a diversion of some kind. There had been several possible sightings of Owl, including one by a very credible source. A co-worker who knew him well saw Al the month after the plane crash, just before Christmas of 1959. He spotted him in a shopping district of Nashville, where Al was originally from. This man turned and looked in response to his name being called by the witness, then deliberately disappeared into the crowd. The witness informed the police he was 100% certain it was Al Taylor. Meanwhile, Francis Spears was increasingly distressed by Alice Taylor's insinuations in the national papers. Both women were in mourning for men they believed had perished on flight 967 in the same seat. With the growing speculation, Francis was having difficulty registering Robert's death for probate as she prepared to sell their Los Angeles home. The abortion case against Robert had been dropped and Donald Loomis was to face charges alone. It was a bad time for the airlines, with four more major US airline crashes in the first three weeks of 1960, including another National Airlines mid-air explosion on January the 6th. In the case of Flight 2511 from New York, investigators recovered over 90% of the fuselage and confirmed willful detonation of dynamite explosives. Although it was impossible to conclusively identify the culprit, suspicion centred on New York attorney Julian A. Frank, who was under investigation for fraud and embezzling over a million dollars. Providing a tenuous connection between the cases, Donald Loomis alleged that Robert had briefly sought advice from Julian Frank on his pending abortion case. Donald Loomis, who openly resented Robert, also said that Robert had been looking to escape to South America. The day after Flight 2511 exploded, January the 7th, Alice reinforced this narrative in the headlines, disclosing she discovered letters from Robert in Al's apartment in Tampa, and that both Robert and his medical qualifications were bogus. Alice was enjoying the spotlight, holding press conferences and exclusive interviews, all turning public opinion against Francis and Robert. That same day, Robert made a secret appearance in Dallas, revealing to Francis that he had been hiding in the Arizona desert since the crash, in a compound owned by Dr. William Terska, another naturopath of dubious repute. Robert insisted that he had no part in the crash and no reason to kill his oldest and dearest friend. He said he had sought refuge with William Terska because he knew that his criminal past would make him a suspect. On the Dallas visit, Robert collected items from his garage before returning to Arizona. Curiously, William later told at least one reporter that Robert was not alone when he first arrived in Arizona after the Flight 967 disaster, but he could not identify Robert's companion or where the man went. There was also the question that a third man was involved based on Robert and Al's plans to meet with the fellow before the crash. A week later, on January the 14th, the FBI report was released to the Civil Aeronautics Board, proposing that Robert faked his own death for his young wife to collect the large insurance policy. The report also documented his long criminal history. 
Alice Taylor felt vindicated as she reminded the media that she had a premonition about Robert's bad character. A belligerent Donald Loomis also claimed Robert had demanded money to stay silent about the extent of the massive abortion operation. However, Alice Taylor got more than she bargained for. On January the 16th, she was stunned to discover her own former husband's criminal past, complete with a long series of mugshots and outstanding warrants for Al's arrest. Alice knew nothing of Al's secret past. She immediately blamed Robert for leading her weak-willed husband astray. In the perfect segue, Alice recalled that Robert was a practiced hypnotist, telling the media that, I believe that Robert hypnotized him into doing it. The hypnosis theme made headlines coast to coast. The nation was captivated. With each passing day, the story got stranger and more puzzling, as layer upon layer was slowly revealed across the national newspapers. Alice was quick to defend Al's good character, acknowledging that the revelation explained his moody and withdrawn behaviour and his strange relationship with Robert. She described him as a man who was easily manipulated, not a criminal mastermind, and she insisted he was not the kind of man who would ever desert his family or leave his son not knowing that he had done exactly that in 1928 nor that he was the criminal mastermind behind their confidence schemes for a decade. So far, Francis had said little to the press, making her an unsympathetic figure. Eager for a national exclusive, Dallas reporter Eddie Barker finally convinced her to speak. Cornered and loyal to her husband, she later admitted that she was in an impossible position and could not reveal the truth. Eddie Barker released a series of interviews with Francis in the weeks that followed. These and other details are available in the book, Self-Styled. The first interview ran on January the 17th and was a national sensation, fueling the rivalry between the widow wives. In Arizona, Robert saw the headlines. He was losing trust in William Terska and decided it was time to make a move. He abandoned the Plymouth in the desert, filed down the serial numbers, and destroyed the crankcase so it was inoperable. He did not realise he had already been recognised on a recent trip to get supplies in Phoenix. William's ex-wife had reported the chance sighting to the FBI. Robert checked into a Phoenix motel under a favourite alias on January the 19th. Hotel staff said he appeared to be waiting for someone and stayed in the lobby for hours. The next day, just as he pulled away in a cab for the airport, FBI agents made their arrest at 3.40 p.m. January 20th, 1960. J. Edgar Hoover personally announced that Robert Vernon Spears was in custody, and the news quickly reached Washington, interrupting discussions on Capitol Hill. During the interrogation, Robert gave a simple account. He and Al were both heading for Dallas. Al wanted to take his car but had a neck injury and couldn't face a long drive to Dallas. Al asked him to drive the 57 Plymouth to Dallas and Robert gave his ticket to Al. Robert heard about the Flight 967 disaster along the way and was devastated to think his old pal had perished. Robert then simply decided it was an opportunity for a fresh start. It was soon clear that the FBI had very little evidence and no concrete basis to charge Robert. They needed to find a loophole to hold him on, and they did. Because Al did not formally give him permission to drive the car west of Texas, he had technically stolen the car, and he was charged with the federal crime of transporting a stolen vehicle over state lines, the 1919 Dyer Act. In the weeks that followed, the soap opera rivalry between Alice and Francis escalated, with new revelations as Alice shared letters exchanged between Robert and Al. Alice's claims that Al had asked her to marry him again were called into question when a mystery woman told reporters that she had a relationship with Al shortly before his disappearance and did not believe he was dead. Francis also made allegations of bribery, payoffs and police corruption within the LAPD. Many other conspiring vested interests emerged, including Al Taylor's own lawyers. As the deep friendship between the con men emerged, many felt it was unlikely that Robert would kill his friend and 41 others. 
violence even for an insurance scam also seemed out of character for both men. The additional motive of escaping a single abortion charge also seemed disproportionate, especially as Robert previously only faced a $1,000 fine and no jail time for a similar offence. Robert Spears' co-defendant, Donald Loomis, had been charged with over 500 abortions and only sentenced to six months. A waitress specifically remembered Al making small talk about going to Dallas, supporting Robert's story. If Al had truly been trying to disappear, buying an insurance policy would have directly sabotaged his plan and made no sense. Others speculated that Al was far more sophisticated and may have done this deliberately to cause confusion. As Al's mental state and past character came into focus, some also wondered if he might have committed murder-suicide without Robert's knowledge. In either case, his erratic behaviour and urgent attempts to find Junior suggest he was planning to leave for some time or for good. The police worked with Mexican law enforcement to seriously explore the significant possibility that Al had fled south of the border. Dallas Radio reported that some of Al's personal belongings appeared to have been found in Dallas. Junior even called in to confirm he had been called to Dallas to identify them. But things went strangely quiet as Alice began legal efforts to declare Al legally dead so Junior could make the insurance claim. Pundits agreed the stolen car charge was flimsy and unlikely to stand. There was nothing concrete to implicate Robert in the Flight 967 disaster and no other new charges were made. He was expected to return to face his single abortion charge and would likely be a free man before long, even if he had to serve some time. So all was shocked when he pleaded guilty to the stolen car charge and was sentenced to the maximum possible of five years. For his abortion charge, he was sentenced to another five years to be served consecutively, in effect 10 years. But to make matters worse, they transferred him to one of the world's most notorious prisons, Alcatraz Island. Robert released Francis from their marriage, but they remained in regular communication. Their young son tragically died while Robert was in prison. Robert even assisted the Taylors in declaring Al dead, not for Junior or Alice, but for reasons of his own. Some still believe that Al had escaped to a new life. In the end, only Alice and Junior benefited financially from the whole incident. The official Civil Aeronautics Board accident report, with the aid of the FBI, concluded that there was no evidence that the Flight 967 disaster had been anything more than an accident. After thoroughly investigating Robert, they found no direct evidence that his activities had any bearing upon the accident. Even so, Robert was tried and convicted in the court of public opinion. This was also convenient for the airlines, and it was perhaps no coincidence that a National Airlines PR man wrote a book essentially concluding that Robert was responsible for the crash. Under the guise of another book deal, journalist Eddie Barker also tried to cash in, suggesting that he could tell Robert's story as a way to support Francis and his children. But no book eventuated, and Eddie published stories that served only to implicate Robert further. It later appeared that Eddie had been working at the behest of the FBI, making recordings that might incriminate the prisoner. From prison, Robert prepared his own case for appeal, after seven years, a judge overturned the stolen car charge and set the conviction aside. But an unsympathetic system slow walked his release for half a year. Robert finally said that he had been coerced by the FBI into pleading guilty under the threat that Francis would also be indicted. He claimed he had been assured a 90-day maximum sentence serving any abortion sentence concurrently. In short, the veteran conman was claiming that he had been conned by the FBI. When he walked out of prison on July the 9th, 1968, the prison was instructed to notify the FBI immediately. He moved back to Dallas, where Francis still lived, to be near his daughter. Francis had by now remarried. Robert died a free man 10 months later on May the 2nd, 1969, aged 73. 
He made headlines again for a final time, as the New York Times marked his death with a two-column obituary. Almost ten years since he was presumed dead in the airplane crash, it was Francis who identified his body. It was also Francis who took care of his memorial and ensured he was remembered for his military service. The man born as Clyde Porter Stringer is buried in the field of honour as Sergeant Robert V. Spears, taking with him many secrets unknown. His remarkable life had almost been forgotten until rediscovered 50 years after his death by Alan Logan and brought back to life in the pages of Alan's book Self-Styled in 2019. This was only possible because Robert left a remarkably diverse trail of captivating headlines and forensic breadcrumbs along the decades of his life's journey, some comical and others tragic. The thousands of documents he left behind allowed Alan to retrace the forgotten footsteps of one of the most notable and mysterious characters of the 20th century. Once again, I would just like to say a huge thank you to Alan Logan for providing this fascinating narration. I'm going to put a link in the description and as a pinned post for the website chasingspears.com. Please make sure you give it a visit. You can buy the book in all types of format and there's also a little two and a half minute video trailer that's really worth seeing. There's some beautiful footage on there. It's a really good video. Please remember to like and subscribe to the channel and if you're able to share this video in any way, such as a community post, I'll be very grateful to you. I'll be interested in hearing your thoughts on what you think happened with the Flight 967. Just to let you know, I should be taking a break from the channel for a few weeks whilst I work on some more narrations and updates to the channel. I hope you all stay safe and well and I'll see you in a few weeks. Please remember there are many playlists and community pages in case you're missing out on the channel so you can have a look and a catch up on any videos that you haven't seen yet. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. Al Taylor's stepson, an acquaintance of Robert Spears, Mr. Paul Blaine Henry, was in the media after the Flight 967 disaster, saying that Al and Robert were going to support his ventures of sales of artwork. In 1992, he was arrested and convicted of high-end art forgery. Goodbye.